because people know if they speak out, there'll be a knock at the door. You know, we'll do to you what we did to Tommy or to Katie or Belfield, who's now in prison. And the cancelling that happened to me happened from the chief rabbi wrote to my editor at the Daily Mail, tell me I had no longer had a job. How did he have that power? You don't mess with the chief rabbi. The Jewish peoples need her removed. Was it all concerted? Like, did it all come almost all like clockwork on the same day? Kind same of day. Same day. That the movement of human flesh, political groups and other religious organisations profit from it. And that's what got me eviscerated. Fuck. I don't own a home anymore because you took it. I don't have a job anymore because you took it. The Muslim majority is getting increasingly strong. And speak to ordinary Brits who, who will tell you, I just feel like second class citizen. I don't belong here. Make no mistake, I challenge Katie multiple times and this gets heated. Because I have a fear of fat people on planes. Empowered, inspiring message about being overweight. You might be able to have more impact. No, you haven't. You're a fat fucker. Get away from the fridge. Uh, you could take some of it. You've put on... How much have you put on since I saw you? Katie Hopkins reveals who controls the world. Once home ownership has been removed, you'll all live in your government accommodation. A social credit system will be in place a digital currency system where you own nothing. And why does that benefit whoever controls the world? Because they have ultimate access to everything and then got my deported stamp from my passport, but I got it tattooed on my arse. And I Did said- you really? Yeah, you wanna see it? Holy Come. shit, you have? Just before we get into this madness, make sure you like this video, subscribe to the channel and turn the notification bell on. Katie. <laughs> Hello. Do we have true freedom of speech right now? <laughs> no, not at all. Not at all. And people speak of this thing often, but I think the majority of people in the UK, or certainly people who have certain views, would say that they even self-censor before the words leave their mouths. Isn't it mad how now this word self-censorship has come out? I was just reading about that today. And yeah, fear of being cancelled makes you suppress and cancel yourself so the system has won. Yeah, and, and that happens, for most people, that happens without them really thinking about it too much. It happens at the point where they know, oh God, I, can't, I shouldn't say that, or you can't say that anymore. And that got kind of reversed into people's heads to the point of their own mouths where they don't even go near it. And I would say not until their front door is shut. And even then, it would have to be their family in their home for them to truly just let, let their guard down and speak freely. Why do we not have freedom of speech? What is suppressing our freedom of speech? Yeah, and, and it becomes that, so we have got it all the way back into families, so families don't speak their truths to each other anymore. But mostly people see the need to self-preserve. And self-preservation for people is everything by, by nature. You defend your own. You know, we were, we were brought up to, you defend your space, defend your home, de defend your family. And the only way to do that really is to self-preserve, to keep your mouth shut. Because people know if they speak out, there'll be a knock at the door. And they've been taught that well by certain individuals who put their heads above the parapet, but it isn't really putting your head above the parapet, it's just saying stuff. And they were schooled, if you speak out against these guys, we'll have you in prison before you can say, you know, we'll do to you what we did to Tommy or to Katie or Belfield, who's now in prison. Don't do these things. And the lesson is these other people who now have nothing and or are in prison. Mm. Where's this coming from then? I think it's just overall the need to have control. From who? From, um, I believe, from government. Certainly, in my experience, at a personal... By the way, are you, are you self cancelling yourself now? Are you being careful what you say? Oh, no. So, so we, could, we no, can have the can unfiltered what... Katie on this show. <laughs> there isn't, I don't You're know. You're not going to that... get cancelled from this show. <laughs> I honestly don't know if the filtered version of me exists. There's been a sort of shift in what I do and how I do it, which we'll talk to. Yeah. But um, it's still the same me. It's the same me that just was deported from Australia for speaking my mind about their ridiculous imprisonment of a whole nation of peoples. But I think uh, from my experience, my, can my kind of erasing from the face of the UK happened after I was reporting on migrants crossing the Med 
and I was on the southern coast of Italy watching these ferries called Save the Children or whatever, Sea Rescue, come in. And the cancelling that happened to me happened from heads of churches. So the heads of churches were involved. The chief rabbi wrote to my editor at the Daily Mail, Martin, uh, to tell me I had no longer had a job. And that's eventually what happened. Uh, Brendan, How did he have that power? The chief rabbi, yeah, because he's called the chief rabbi. You don't mess with the chief rabbi and right. everything that that means. Uh, so did he have ownership of the newspaper, or is he just a powerful person? Well, so must be linked, right? So then there was so there was specific groups. There was the chief rabbi. I still have the email actually, because Martin forwarded it to me what, saying, "What the fuck?" What did it say? Katie Hopkins is reporting on migrants. She is uh, th this fascism has to stop. She should not be allowed to continue. The, the, the Jewish peoples need her removed. Uh, Brandon Cox was involved, Who's Save that? the Children, uh, as in Brandon Cox. Yeah. Uh, and brought, when you say he's involved, he, how? he emailed my editor, and what did he say? Martin, same sort of stuff. Katie needs to go immediately. This is very disruptive to charitable organisations. This misrepresents the British peoples. Uh, Board of Deputies, um, which is a Jewish alliance, the heads of synagogues all over the UK and globally were involved and then Labour were involved and, and others of course there was the Guardian petition all the rest of it but all I'm saying to you is that there is an, when you say who church Jewish organizations Labour charities government media was all, it all concerted like did it all come almost all, like clockwork on the same day kind same of day same day same day and Martin's my editor and, I, and the reason I can say all of this is because it's re I've never really spoken about it because I don't believe in boring people with minutiae. But I have that rabbi's, the chief rabbi's email, and I have Brandon Cox's, and I have the board of deputies one. And it happens in concert with each other on the same day. And Martin was blown away. So even. you think this is strategically aligned? Yes, these are a strategic alliance of the most powerful representatives of the biggest religious groups, the biggest charities and the heads of political parties. Um, what, I have no doubt about that whatsoever. So we'll come back to that in a minute. What did you say that crossed the line? I, I actively showed by standing on the tippy toes of Save the Children boat acting as a ferry boat and then being uh, interviewing certain members of the Italian public who were coordinating these and were receiving money and the hotels they were taking. Basically the chain of money that follows the movement of human flesh across the channel. Um, that's not across the channel, I'm sorry, across the Med at the time. That's what got me removed. I strongly am co absolutely committed to the idea that the movement of human flesh is the most profitable industry that there is and churches and political groups and other religious organisations profit from it. And that's what got me eviscerated. Fuck. How much would you have to be paid to marry Sadiq Khan? <laughs> I would literally have the dick of Sadiq Khan in my hand, balance it on my little finger like that. Oh, 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 and get what I want. Come on now. Let's put some more white people back in zones one to five. Come on. Oh, oh, oh. I'm thinking about your cavernous vagina. <laughs> <laughs> you were making out that he had a penis like that, but you did this with your vagina. Why do you speak up about it knowing that it could ruin your life? I never knew at the time because I was writing this stuff and I was docking, you know, I'm not sat in a studio going, oh, these migrant boats, this is terrible, we should stop the boats. You stood there looking at the Save the Children crew and you're on the phone to Save the Children PR asking, I want to get on the boat. And you're watching, you know when they're going to leave. You've got people tracking that vessel and it is meeting up with the migrants that are dropped off by the Libyan Coast Guard at an agreed destination and you're tracking them to the hotels and you're following the chain of money and you have the pictures to show it, you become very problematic indeed because you're not just opining from a studio, you are showing. And that never really be done in that way, not, a, not, on a, not in a Daily Mail platform, not at that size. And because it was being picked up in the US by Tucker, by Fox, it became, I became very problematic.
very problematic and, and was removed. And I don't regret a single sausage of it. And I, and I actually, uh, it's helped me a lot in understanding how things operate, how they work, why I'm never allowed to be back on any screens ever again. So what did you get cancelled and removed from? List it, social media, mainstream media, what Yeah, went? so to start off with, um, so Daily Mail, Martin was like, this is just, we're, he, so it was agreed that we would stagger my leaving, because Martin, as the editor, and I don't know if you know Martin, but Martin is of the view that, you know, no one tells Martin what to do, but it was agreed that I would be gone within six months. I lost LBC Radio. I think I'd lost that just prior, as I was removed from that. I realised quite soon after that that I was then removed from the mainstream media. And I say that specifically because what would happen, and you know this, and anybody that gets booked by shows will know this, you, get, you do something and you get a call from a producer, say Laura Ingram or Tucker Carlson, so big shows in the States, and they say, oh, we loved your stuff on this, can you come on the 10 o'clock, do, 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 do. And that's how it works. I jump on a train. That was the system. And what would happen then for about a week or so, 20 minutes later, someone would call and say, oh, um, that topic is being pulled. Or we've had, a, we've had a change up of the lineup. So we're not going. And I'd be on the train headed there. And later on, I'd see that they'd maybe swap me out with somebody less me and found someone else to cover my topic. And eventually I realised that I was, I was, I've been removed from everything. So I, I'm assuming there exists a list that I'm on that says I can no longer be on mainstream media. And I've never, ever been on it again since. Wow. What about social media? Did you lose any accounts? So always been, I've been removed from Twitter. So the Twitter removal happened just after all of the rabbi and the charities and the politicians and a coordinated group. Um, which are labour activists. Uh, it's called the Centre for Countering Digital Hate Online. It used to be a limited company run by one guy, got bought out by a group. And they went together with um, the Muslim Council and Rachel Riley, uh, went together to the Twitter headquarters and got my Twitter account removed. Uh, and that remains removed now. So, um, but I have YouTube and, and uh, Instagram, but I never used those historically. And in this last five years of being utterly removed, I now use those. So for five years, until uh, September 2021, for five years, I hadn't spoken in the UK. Wow. So when we first met, yeah. um, I said to you, maybe you should think about having a podcast because you own that <laughs> channel. And you were like, nah. <laughs> and then you got fucking banned from everywhere. Yeah. Um, are you now thinking about decentralization and maybe owning your own media and being on more decentralized or less policed platforms like Rumble and Getter and having a podcast? And um, are you seeing an evolution of media in response to this cancel culture? Yeah. And I decentralized, but like what you just described there, if we were in an elevator, and I'm not saying this in a hierarchy way, because in no way do I think mainstream media is like top floor. <laughs> it really isn't. It's just the most controlled form of uh, propaganda there is. But if you take that down to where you were, which is get a rumble podcast, no disrespect to your podcast, which obviously None is doing taken. brilliantly. Yeah. Um, I kind of decentralized by dropping the elevator down to the basement and deciding, right, I'm going to go full Jesus and I'm just going to take to the streets. And that's what I did. So I took to the streets of America and I've spent five years doing that three or four month tours through the states of America, building an audience, but building them in rooms. And, and that really is my decentralized new media is rooms of people. Mm. And it's become very much like um, whilst arguably and, and correctly, <laughs> my audience therefore is tiny and time consuming and effort, effort filled <laughs> for, for little um, kind of amplification. Scalability. Exactly, yeah. or reach or share mm. that we might talk of. It is so, it, I think it saved my life a thousand times over because just having people in rooms has been really so much more 
rewarding, of course, than, than just mm. what is what are numbers, what are clicks, what are what are they? There's just sort of this ethereal nothingness, whereas rooms of people, and it feels like it's become. I, I genuinely feel part of this new kind of speakeasy. So like in the time of prohibition, which I wasn't around for, contrary to the rude fuckers that think I look 110. <laughs> um, this is now this is now speakeasies, and there's many in America where people meet sort of in secret, just to speak. Mm. Uh, I know bars where there is a separate back room that you can only entrance if you know the way in, and we have speakeasies there. Mm. There's also auditoriums of, in Pennsylvania recently, 4,500 people with General Flynn. But same in the UK, turning up in venues where I can speak, they gather their people, and we have a brilliant time. So I would say that's how I've decentralised, mm. but certainly I see it rumble, getter, and my concern with all of those is every single time they split and splinter. And so your yeah. audience is more and more split, whereas the opposite is what I suspect you were trying to do, and I'm definitely trying to do, which is pile people together. Yeah. Because we're so much more alike than we know. Mm. That, that's mm. the answer. It was quite long. <laughs> it's all right. We've got time. Um, so I see rumble, getter, etc. a bit different to your own podcast. So um, I think pure decentralization is where you can connect with your follower, fan, and audience member directly, and then you can move them with you. And to a certain degree, podcasts, you can do that. You can definitely do that if you've got someone's email or co contact details. Getter and Rumble and other platforms like that are good in that they'll embrace all the people that have been pushed away from mainstream social media. Because it's funny how we had mainstream media, then social media disrupted mainstream media. And now we've got social media, some of it's almost, almost become the new mainstream media. And so then you've got Getter, Rumble, etc. Yeah. But, but I mean, what's to say it, in a few years, Getter and Rumble don't become the new YouTube and Twitter. They don't become corporatized and commercialized and privatized, which one of them might be already. And then, they, and then it, just, it just cascades down. Whereas if you have your own podcast, you have your own platform. <laughs> Is this you still lecturing me about having a podcast? <laughs> Yeah, this is like a five-year lecture, <laughs> but uh, like, uh, yeah. It has gone on. <laughs> yeah. Maybe Basically. you'll listen this time. <laughs> Basically, we haven't seen each other in five years, but your message is still the same. Yeah. Have a podcast. Yeah, well, it's not just to you, Katie. It's to all my listeners as well, because I there know. are a lot of people who listen to me don't want to be cancelled, don't want to have to self-counsel, don't want to be careful what they say all the time. Don't want to really always be worried about offending people. They want to be authentic and be themselves. I know, I totally hear you. And a lot of my listeners, they're not far left or far right or no, want to no, tell everyone. They, they just themselves. Yeah, they just get in and have a good debate. I totally get it. And I think that's where people like uh, me and others have a role, which is just being that person, just blah, blah. You know, Ooh. and being out there and doing lives and doing whatever, and people pile on in, and almost even if they're not saying it for themselves, it's bloody comforting that even if they really disagree, it's comforting to have someone just chucking it out there. And it's also comforting, and I'm in a very privileged position of really not having and not a sob story at all, but there's not much anyone can take from me now that will stop me. Because people need to self preserve stuff they've got, right? A home or a marriage or a or a job or your kids' welfare and protection. And it's not like I don't give a shit about my kids or my husband or my home. It's just that we've been through it already and there's nothing anyone can take from me that makes me feel concerned now. You wanna, you know, I go to the States. Unvaccinated people aren't allowed to go to the States. I go to the States. I, are, I you am, un are you un- Yes, yeah. I'm done with being told what to do. So I'm going to the States, I'm being Jesus on the road and bringing my people together. You want to lock me up for that? Do it. Bring it. Because you just locked up a woman for going and bringing people together and making people feel better about themselves. Do it. And that's where I'm at with all of this. It's full extreme. Do it. I don't own a home anymore because you took it. I don't have a job anymore because you took it. I have kids, but they all changed their names and I have nothing to do with any of their schools because you tried to take them. Bring it. So that, and that is very, that's a really lovely feeling. Like, there, I love my life. Is there no regrets, though, of putting your family through all that? No, because that would be to infer that that's what I did. And that, I think that would be wrong. I 
I was a bloody good writer for the Daily Mail. I was a bloody good uh, radio person on LBC. I cocked up all the time, but I was good at, at letting people have their say. And, um, and because I was good at my job, they came for everything. Uh, I feel terribly that people tried to, um, you know, have tried to take my children. I feel As so people have tried to take them, kidnap them. Uh, there was a t well, there's some stuff there, yeah. And then social services have been involved oh. a lot. Uh, so I'm reported as abusing my children, abusive mother. My children have had to be interviewed separately, privately, when they were younger as well. Like now they're older, but then they were asked, you know, on their own questions of whether I'd done things to them. Um, so people tried to take my children. So I feel badly that that happened because of me, but I, it was because I was good at my job. So I can't carry the guilt too much, and guilt's never so good for... So many people carry guilt, mm. regular mums and dads all the time. And I just like, let that go. Mm. So, um, so there's nothing anyone can really take from me. And then I think we did head feeling when we met last, five years ago. Did I let you feel my head? Yes. You remember? Yeah, because I've got there's a, missing, a big scoop. I've got a hole. Yeah, yes. yeah, I do remember that. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I, I, there might scoop. be a better word. No, I think that is the medical. <laughs> yeah. That is yeah. how they explained it yeah. when they were going to scoop my head off. Yeah. So, yeah, so I'm missing this bit of my head, right? Because I, I was, sorry for listeners that weren't with us. Yeah. So I was massively epileptic at one stage. Mm. Like seizures were crazy. Like they would dislocate my arms and stuff. And so I had this massive surgery where they, they basically get a circular saw and they chop your head off and then they get the bit of tumour out and throw it away. So my point was that a, a seizure should have wiped me out. That was the prediction before I was 40. Now I'm like 47. And most people think I'm 63, it really fucks me off. And uh, I will think about plastic surgery at 50. And, um, and so I'm also on this kind of free time, like extra time. Like, mm. it's like being at the World Cup, but like a whole lot better. Right. <laughs> because I'm not in Qatar. And so I'm on this huge extra time thing. And so there's nothing, you know, people say I, I live without fear, but I totally do. Like if today is it, it's been, it's been pretty epic. Mm. Yeah, really, I love it. Wow. <laughs> I do, I do, I love it. I'm really lucky that way. Once home ownership has been removed, you'll all live in your government accommodation. A social credit system will be in place. A digital currency system where you'll own nothing. And why does that benefit whoever controls the world? Because they have ultimate access to everything. And then got my deported stamp from my passport. I got it tattooed on my ass. And I you said, really? Yeah, you want to see it? Holy Come. shit, you have. Is there anything looking back that you've said that you think, I shouldn't have said that? <laughs> well, there's the tweet that cost me my home. What was where the tweet? I, well, let's not definitely repeat it, you know, so that it becomes another thing, because we can't afford to lose more houses, can we? But I basically accused some trout of doing something she didn't do. I got the people muddled up. Oh. I can't even remember her name. I've kind of erased that from my... And it was someone, it's, it was a terrible thing. Someone defiled a war memorial, which really pisses on my chips because I'm ex-military. And I launched one on Twitter, but I got the wrong person. It was some other really obnoxious lefty. You know, they're interchangeable. But anyway, she, she uh, sufficiently got litigated and a new law was created that said a new online law, because that law, of course, doesn't exist until we make it up, that said that I did her serious harm at the time of publication of that tweet. And that cost me my home um, to fight that. Because I tried to fight on the basis that you could not, serious harm cannot just be perceived. You cannot just perceive serious harm. I, I was trying to, like, preserve some sort of speech for other people at this point. But the law was amended and became new. Mine is the case law for perceived serious harm. No regrets? No, no, not even that. But, but surely might you not have regret getting the name right? Well, you could sort of say, in hindsight, I wish I got the name right. <laughs> I totally feel like yeah. that. But now I see the way online, you know, that law ended up 
some some lovely comedian, funny funny woman and left left woke 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 but whatever funny stood up somewhere I think bloody Edinburgh did a gig about her husband and their divorce and what a shitbag he was funny stuff he used my law of perceived serious harm to take her apart and and that was the very thing when when the Guardian and Channel Four were all celebrating the demise of Katie Hopkins you want to go guys. This is going to bite you in the ass. And of course it did. And of mm. course the Guardian was very sorry for the lady who's, who lost everything because her husband sued her. But this is the way of the world and the way the law is going. But I think there's things you learn very quickly being me or someone like us, or maybe just me, but uh, is, you know, the law is not the law. It's whatever a powerful person decides for it to be. Democracy is at best an illusion. And, and at uh, worst? And at worst, a contrivance of control. And, um, and when you find out those things, it's, it's disappointing. Because you kind of want to believe in those things. Like, I liked it when I thought police officers were like top blokes. And, and what do you think they are now? It's instruments of the state. Right. And, um, and I think that, has, that isn't to do with being cancelled from social media now or it isn't to do with being cancelled from your job. You know, that's, that's way out there. This is about being removed by your own family group now. This is about being removed by your neighbours. So like COVID and lockdown made it so that those conversations were so punitive, people stopped even talking to their own family about what they actually felt. And what? I think that's where we're at now. Because for example, people who were pro or anti-vaccine would disown someone who disagreed. Yeah, it became the new left and right, or the new far left, far right, whatever. Whether you were pro, if you were pro um or part of the group that felt that your life was somehow at risk by people who were anti or just didn't subscribe or wanted everyone to do their own thing, that became so conflict ridden that people lost loads of their friends or family members or were disinvited from funerals or weddings. If, I mean, you only had to look at, I don't know where you sit on, I always like to ask you things. You can ask me whatever you want. I remember this last time and you going, I'm asking the questions. Where did you sit on lockdown? Were you very happy with lockdown? Um, so, I, f I understood why lockdown one was decided. Because what I tried to do retrospectively is put myself in that position. Because it's easy to, to bark from the other side of the fence. If I was in the pen, um, I, I could personally have forgiven lockdown one for a brief amount of time until it was very clear that um, some people call um, it a glorified common cold, other people call it basically the flu, whatever. But at some point it was very clear that the implications of locking down could be much more worse than um, not locking down. So as far as I'm con concerned, the second one and the third one were gross misjustices. Um, and to, be, to have all of your livelihoods taken away from you and not be able to go and see your families at funerals. And many, we had a, a staff member, lovely lady, she just recently died of cancer and it just took her really quick. And we're all convinced that she couldn't get her treatment quick enough. And had it not been for the complete constriction of the NHS, partly due to lockdown, she probably would have got seen. Um, and I wonder how many more people are like that. And I understand now that there's data coming out that says that the consequences of lockdown are worse than what lockdown saved. So, um, that's my view. Mm. And I think that's, you know, can, everyone can say, well, in hindsight, do, 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 do. But I think at the time when some of us... Just sorry to interrupt you, just to be super clear. I, I gobbed off about this at the time. So I'm not sitting there going, oh, oh look, no, looking no. back. Like, the, the lockdown happened, I'm like, careful, careful. All the businesses are going to go under. The economy's going to be fucked for a decade. Careful, careful, and then within a few weeks, I just started gobbing off about it. And I've, yeah. got, I've got 110 staff in my offices, I've got another 44 outsourcers, I've got 360 properties and 1,200 tenants. I've got a lot to fucking lose 
if it I get lot. shut down. Yeah, but I still stood up and said exactly what I thought was right. I, yeah. I'm not yeah. saying you were being uh, in hindsight. Yeah, sorry, I, I just to wanted to make that clear. Though. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's a lot of people you've got to look after. Yeah, yeah. You don't but, look that old, as in <laughs> age does not weary them, as in the burden of being responsible for making sure all those people take their pay packet home. I'm not saying yeah. you're some sort of father figure and you have to look after them. But what I'm well, saying we, we is didn't you really, have to... We didn't really let anyone go in lockdown. I worked fucking 16 hours a day to keep all of them in a job. Uh, and I'm really proud of that. And I actually really love having all those people. Yeah, of course you hopefully do. Hopefully there's lives are better. Epic. Yeah. I know, and I the think it's epic the government, you have them. The government nearly ruined my ability to do that um, while they were having fucking parties. Um, and while they were breaking their own rules. Um, yeah, especially, I remember, do you remember that Christmas when they called it the soft lockdown? And they, f they just absolutely ruined so many businesses. Five and a half million small businesses. And by the way, where's all the support for those five and a half million support, small businesses? You know, a lot of people in this country go, um, oh yeah, we should tax the rich more. No, you shouldn't. You should tax the super rich more. And the rich, you should fucking let them grow their business. Because probably people think if you earn 150 grand a year, you're rich. You're not. But let's say you earn a million and you're rich. You're not. But let's say you are. Those people need less tax and less friction and less intervention. But the billionaires, they just, if you charge the billionaires 5% more tax, that's trillions more in the economy. Give that all to the small businesses. The small businesses grow the economy. And, and we won't all get charged 65, 70% tax, which is what's happening now. Anyway, this is about Katie Hopkins, not Rob Moore. Where no, were not we? At all. No, I know where we were, but I think, I think it's an important thing that you do employ all those people and you give homes, I don't give, you mm. create a transaction whereby people have homes that they can rely on and someone supplying the homes that looks after them. And, it's, and that kind of is the point about lockdown, is it threatened people like you and those people who didn't make it through. Who pay millions of pounds a year in taxes and generate tens of millions for our local economy. Yeah, and, and had possibly run that business for six or eight years, years, but for 20 years a florist and then shut down. Yeah. And that, I think, was such the heartbreak. And it, or, what I was trying to say, and where we were, we were talking about where, how I see police now. Mm. But so for police and for us to watch them impose and enforce lockdowns, in such a brutal way, so that for some of us who went to gatherings in a park to say that we don't agree with this, but we're meeting up, you know, and we were polite and distanced and all the rest of it, but it was about just going, we're standing because we know this has got to be wrong. Watching the police police that, when some of them, at least some of them must have known what you know and what they knew and what the person with the mum with cancer knew, or the person who was gonna lose their shop or their restaurant or their bar knew. Police, some of those police knew that, but were still willing to beat up people in the street. And that's, to me, that's broken, that's broken my faith in anything to do with policing completely. And, and it always will do. And same in Canada with those truckers that, oh, oh God, yeah, that, that was, was one of the hottest, hottest moments of my life, that those truckers just existed. I'm spitting at the mouth. Just, they were just minus 35 degrees in their trucks, wearing a t-shirt, dragging their enormous testicles through the snow. Just that, that's a bit, I mean, it's not gonna work brilliantly well for your setup, but I mean, who gives a fuck? So just like schlepping these testicles <laughs> through the snow to protest at Trudeau, locking people down. So you know, um, we were talking about cars earlier because my son's um, mad on cars, but, um, and you have a very nice one, car, not testicles, although maybe also that, I don't I've know. I've never had a problem dragging mine. Have you not? No. Do you swing or do I you just, package? Oh, I just empty them regularly. Oh, do you? Not too heavy. It's a thought one doesn't need, <laughs> probably. But um, yes, yeah, so uh, you know on, what is it, that, what's the car called that has the spirit of ecstasy on the Rolls Royce? See, I knew, no, I knew, he's, he's so... He's so the car dude. <laughs> he he's not there off camera, obviously, but yeah. he's such the dude. So the Rolls Royce has the spirit of ecstasy, right? Uh, on the bonnet trunk, as Americans would say. And I offered to go out to the truckers to stand naked on their trunks, bonnets, whatever, um, and to be the spirit of the menopause. <laughs> because I was, so, I was so thrilled that those men, because what happens when people like that make that stand 
is it isn't just about them and their trucks and their massive testicles, which I would ride every day in a heartbeat, just out of, just to say thank you, really. Uh, although I do wonder about the hygiene factors of being in a truck for two weeks without a bathroom. But there we are. And I, I just feel that when something like that happens, the, the ramifications of it were seismic. So people like on the west coast of America were cheering the truckers. Like I would be on the road in gathering groups of people and you mention the truckers and people would be in tears. And that's what I love about what we're trying to do or, or being able to be decentralised mm. is the ramifications of someone doing something are huge without the help of the mainstream because mm. the media were obviously against them in every regard. Yeah. So, so do I believe and trust in the police? No. So I think what you've said has reminded me why I always wanted to be and I love to be an entrepreneur. Because one of the great benefits of being decentralised in media and having your own enterprise is when you don't agree with something and you can say fucking no. But let's go into the shoes of the police man or woman that may have executed some orders they didn't agree with. Well, they might be in £75,000 worth of debt and need to feed their family. And they may not want to do that, but they may have an internal conflict and they may go into self-preservation. I'm not defending all, no, but no, you know. No, I but, see what you're saying. It's yeah. a completely valid point, obviously. Yeah. I made a decision to start my own businesses 16 years ago and it wasn't easy and I made a lot of sacrifices and I lost friends and lost things along the way. But now, if someone forces me to do anything, I can say, fuck you. Um, and if I want to say something on social media, I've got the choice to say it. And if I want to say no, I can say no. And I think for your own identity and your strength and your self-worth and your mental health and your feeling of value, I think that's really important. And um, over the years, as my brand has grown, some have forgotten that at heart I'm an entrepreneur. I'm not just a commentator. And that for me is the best advert for being an entrepreneur. The, and, and, and to be financially free. Because in my world, a lot of people talk about money and it's like a disgusting oh, no. discussion. But having money gives you the choice to say no. And interestingly though, which and, and as an entrepreneur, you have to have scalability of finances because your finances aren't just looking after you or your beautiful assistant. But they're looking after 110 people in the offices and the people who run the properties and 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 mm. you have a whole community that are not dependent on you. I don't mean that in a negative way. I just mean that you are going to make sure they're bloody all right because that's mm. who you are. Mm. But what I also love is the people who had nothing. And by nothing, I mean maybe a home that they could just about afford or a husband. But they still were able to say no. Mm. So the, 100, the NHS 100,000 doctors and nurses and staff who were told if you don't have this not wanting to bang on about but if you don't have this and you're losing your jobs and they were told it and then the line you know the dates came closer and then they brought in hr and they had their sit down meetings where they were you know went through the paperwork so it was more and more forced so that you would go home be really anxious about it and people at home husbands wives were saying why don't you just have it we can't afford for you not to and they bloody held that line and I went from top to tail of the country, rallying with the NHS 100,000 to, to just bloody applaud them on, on the behalf of, of people like me who thought they were being heroes for holding the line. And they held that line. I remember standing the week before that, the deadline in Truro in Cornwall and this huge crowd were out. And then with like four days to go until they lost their jobs the government U-turn because that 100,000 didn't break the line. Mm. So there's something about, you talk about being an entrepreneur and that allows you to say no. There is also something about having the moral courage and fibre to say no and despite not knowing how you're going to make it okay. Mm. You can't really afford to do that because you need to keep a whole bunch of people going. Well, you'll just make it so it's okay. Yeah. But other people still said no even when they didn't know how it was going to be okay. And mm. I think that's a very cool thing too. Mm. I, that rocked. They were the Canadian truckers, NHS 100,000, and all the good people out there now mm. who, are, who have like a rebellion in their hearts somewhere. Mm. I love them. These are good days. I've often thought, what does Katie Hopkins... What do you think that? 
Let me Do you think they're in the shower? Night time? <laughs> Naked? Alone? Carry along. <laughs> what, would <Ka> <laughs> what would Katie Hopkins put at the top of her CV as her job description, her job title? <laughs> yeah. What is Katie Hopkins' job title? <laughs> what do you do? Uh, so what are you? And that, honestly, is such a great question because I don't have the answer. So, so you can see why I think about that a lot. Yeah, I thought it was going to be like, what it'd be like to touch her boobs. I thought it was going to be that. It's not that, is it? I don't know if it's like that either because I don't, I don't know. But, um, yes, yeah, so on my, I don't know, is it Insta? Is it a war zone on two legs? But I think that's probably unhelpful. That was my husband who calls me that. But I... I I never s took to the word journalist because it felt too worthy, you know, and a lot of what I did was based on gut and emotion and heart, so that's not journalism. And then I love words more than anything, but what, are you going to be a wordsmith? Which is great and actually is a lot of what I do, but that's not it. I signed up to be a, you know, I was an army intelligence officer for, and I signed up for 35 years to do that, and I had to leave because I'm epileptic, but, so what am I, army officer? No, not anymore. Um, and then sometimes I try, right, oh, I'm an ordinary wife and mum, and then I'm like, no, bullshit, are you? So I actually have no clue what I am at all. I just believe in, I believe I, I just have this purpose to, to help bring people together and make them feel bloody better and give them some sense of hope that we're in this fight and, and it matters. You matter. I want you to stay alive through lockdown. I care about you. And stop beating yourself up for all shit because I've done all of it but worse. Every, if there's a failure, I've failed harder. But I want people to keep going. And what's so amazing now is just to walk about. So it, I would totally think you said about the haters. I fell over today in front of a bus. And... Um, as much as I guess some people on the bus, well, most people wouldn't give a shit and wouldn't know who I am from Adam, and that's perfect. Uh, some people would have been like, oh, yes, I hope she breaks her face. But actually, as I go about- How many the, points for Katie Hopkins? <laughs> yeah, that's like gotta be 20 points right there. Like, people would be like, yeah, look at her. Did she break her face? But a gentleman that came along and helped me up, um, a cool guy, actually, and he was like, you keep doing what you're doing. But I was like, do you mean falling over, being a twat in the street? Yeah. You keep going. And that's more the feeling now, is yeah. over the last couple of years, a weird change has happened. I feel like I kept going in the same track, but people kind of did a 180 and started coming with me. Yeah. Um, or going, I thought you were such a twat, but now you're all right. Or yeah. now I, I kind of agree with some things. Or now I see what you were trying to say, or you were just saying your stuff. So I st that doesn't answer your question about what's my bloody job title. Mm. I don't think I have one. Well, it's a good job you're unemployable then, isn't it? I think Otherwise that might you'd have be to it. fill in a CV. Yeah, I, th I don't have a job title. I don't know what it is I do. Mm. But I definitely have faith and confidence in it. Mm. I can't call myself a stand-up yet, although that's part of what I do. Um, that's how I earn money, probably. Mm. I think I, I sell stories on the road, but... I have some kind of purpose, and I don't know what it is, but I know that every single time I throw myself to it, the sort of path, un path reveals itself as I go. Mm. Are you misunderstood? No, no. I think that's an excuse that people would use to cover for themselves. You know, I'm fucking annoying. Like, I'm really annoying. I do things that are mind-bendingly irritating you know prove the fact people could make an effort put on four stone in three months lose it again in three months why that's, is that annoying that's a bloody and i did that and that's annoying for fat people some twat comes along and goes oh, i can be fat <laughs> well, i can be thin <laughs> and then you prove it but well, you'll turn out to be quite a nice person in the doing of it that's annoying uh, it's annoying that I'm still around. Is it annoying or is it disruptive and challenging? Yes, also those, yeah, it's, it's a lot of that. It's, it's disruptive and challenging that I haven't just laid down, hidden away and gone to work at Marks and Spencer's. It's annoying and challenging that I get paid 450k to go on 
Australian Big Brother, but never get to go on the programme because I gob off about lockdown whilst I'm being isolated and get deported. Did, I so am did, did you get the money for that or did you not get the there, money for that? There were certain elements of it that I got that we just, we just fought for just to mostly piss them off. And then I turned up in Arizona where I'm not allowed to be either because I'm not vaccinated a week later and then got my deported stamp from my passport. Big fucking great red deported stamp on my passport. I got it tattooed on my ass. And I did said, you really? Yeah, you want to see it? Yeah. Are you seriously it? All right then. Oh, that's my mic, sorry. Holy Can shit, you have got... Well, it's yeah. sort of on the lower back. It's not on well, the Well, I wasn't going to get my full anus out, <laughs> even though you want it <laughs> so badly. It's all you dream about. You diverted when you say, when you think about me, it's about a podcast. It's really about my anus, isn't it? <laughs> it is. And I sent that picture to the Australian Prime Minister. Did you get that on camera? Can we, get it on, can we get it on camera? Okay, that makes you such a retard. <laughs> but how bad a yeah, camera just... Yeah, can we I get it on camera? No, it's, 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 no it's, I understand the point you're making. I'm just calling, busy calling him a tard. I prefaced it. I told him yeah, it was he, coming. Yeah, you mean he hasn't done his job? Fucking He yes. had one job. And all to I get said to... was, I have got a tattoo on my ass. If you were a camera guy, what would you think at that point? You'd think, I better get my camera ready. Wouldn't right. you? Tard. You ready, Harry? Right, hold on. I don't want to get too much arse out because I don't want to be a dickhead. Yeah. Can, Can you, you turn help a bit? Me? Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Pull it down a bit more. Your cheek's not out. That's there it. Go, buddy. Yeah, got it. <laughs> it's the money shot. <laughs> <laughs> Is it though? So yeah, it's ch I'm challenging. I know, but I think at a time of almost universal constraint, having someone as liberated as I am um, is useful. And I think it's uh, the way I feel at the moment is really positive. Like, there's a lot of momentum coming our way. Disruptive, this is a disruptive time, right? Mm. There's going to be a, another party, and there has to be in this country. This is, a, this is going to be a great time we're headed into, mm. even at the darkest time. That's what I think. Why do you think those that hate you hate you? I think we all want to hate someone or something. We galvanise ourselves, don't we? Like in Panto. You need a baddie. And there aren't many baddies anymore. Think about back in time, there were great baddies. Darth right? Vader, the best baddie. Darth ever. Vader. We had Dallas or Dynasty or what people watched. The Joker. Right? Yeah. There was always great, yeah. ba like on series, there were baddies. Yeah. But now we don't really have any baddies because everybody wants to be liked. Even in what became the artifice of, of kind of uh, reality, right? used to be that you would have baddies, apprentice, me, right? Mm. But then it became that everybody wanted to be the person in the jungle that was liked. Everybody wanted to come out as the winner who was like, oh, now you're going to have a book deal or a cake deal or a baking deal. Or, uh. And no one wanted to just be themselves and be, well, fuck it, you hate me, you hate me. And that's, we're missing that. And, uh, and I provided that role for a lot of people, rightly so, because I said shit that was really offensive to a whole different bunch of people and I don't regret it I don't retract any of it I don't apologize for any of it what pissed them off it was always so in their face so like um, Black Lives Matter the protest here in London I don't know if you were here for it it was huge I mean it was huge and uh, and I was right in amongst them I was dressed like a little toady rat bag lefty from the guardian I had like a long anorak on and i had a sign that said i don't stand no wait a minute i don't understand but i stand which was the apologetic white so i played the apologetic white and i was stood next to big black dudes with banners saying katie hopkins is the cause of racism in the uk so it's being so in their faces with my view which is that white people and black people always got along great and Black Lives Matter was the most divisive thing to happen in history. So, um, yeah, I've been bloody annoying, but I'm not misunderstood. It just took people a while to realise I wasn't the monster the media wanted me to be. I was mm. just a woman that had strong views and wasn't going to apologise, and that's all I am now. Mm. I've, I kind of kept a constant on that, I think. But I don't, I don't regret anything. Well, we'll ask that question at the end, and we'll see if we can pull out one. <laughs> Go on, then. At the end. Um, what's the current state of the UK? 
Um, can we say fucked? You can say whatever you want. Brilliant. Uh, the so, UK is fucked. Yeah, and I, you know, so five years across the states of being silenced here, imploring the US not to become like the UK, imploring the US not to fall as we have fallen. And bear in mind, I love my country. I signed up to fight for my country. I would happily go out and fight the good fight tomorrow. Um, and that'd be the last day. But imploring the states not to follow down the well-worn path that we've all seen. Which the is... same playbook that we've seen, which is country overtaken by outsiders, diminishing of the traditional country country culture and ideals of a country okay so we just got the 2021 census out blah 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 less than half the country are christian most identify as atheist the muslim majority is getting increasingly strong it's not a majority in the country but if you go to towns luton london bradford leicester birmingham and that isn't problematic in itself except that diversity always means not white and no one will recognize that at the point that whites are not a majority, sorry, they're a minority, they should also have some rights. It will be important to look after white people just as it's important to look after ethnic groups and others. Um, and what breaks my heart is to travel and speak to ordinary Brits who, who will tell you, I just feel like second class citizen. I don't belong here. It, small business owners who weren't supported in any way driving the economy through. <laughs> People who just feel like they're constantly at the back of the line, who are actively looking, where could I go? How do I get out? Where could I travel to? Where could I escape to? That breaks my heart. So we're fucked in the way that demographically we're already gone. Seven out of ten new entrants to schools in London are Muslim children. No problem, but demographically that tells you something. Um, most common name in the country, Mohammed II, Mohammed. It tells you something. And it tells me that white Christians one day will look to leave this country. And that, that makes me very sad. And not only does it make me sad, it does make me want to kind of help fighting for people who feel they, they no longer count in this country. And, um, and so spending time in America, warning of that, and then seeing the Biden administration, same playbook, flood the country take away the rights of taxpayers and workers, make it so they're at the back of the line. It just, that's just, just hard things to reconcile. It's much easier and equally as profitable to uh, govern over the managed decline of a country. And it's much harder to fight for a country, which is, in my opinion, why people hated Trump so much, because he actually was fighting for America. And that's not in common with any other of the the countries that we know of, I think. If you were Prime Minister, what, yes. would, what would be the first thing Wouldn't you would do? Wouldn't it be so great? A, it would be great. <laughs> would it? Yes, because I am five foot eight and a full six foot in my favourite heels. And Rishi Sunak is five foot four. And I appreciate this could be seen as heightist. And that has absolutely zero relevance oh, to Oh, come on <laughs> To now, anything. Robert, Robert, what are you saying? All short people, invariably have issues, right? Can Don't we agree that? all people have issues? Short people have more issues than all people. Can we agree that? Um, I need more time to think about that. I'm when, not coming under that bus with you just yet. When you see a short person, do you think, oh, there's a nice person, or do you think, oh, God, that person's short? I think the second thing. I also see men who are incredibly short but very wide because they're trying to compensate for the issue by becoming wider. I don't think that helps. It's the reason I quit The Apprentice. Lord Sugar is nipple height. I can't work for someone who's nipple height. Rishi but Sunak. he's made 800 million. Not bad for a short guy. You're, you're obsessed with cash. No, I'm not. Lord Sugar. That, that was a projection, Katie. Sadiq Khan, nipple height. Dr. Fauci, fill it in, fill in the blank. Nipple height. See what I'm saying? How tall is Donald Trump? He's tall. Well, so there you go. Like so. a skyscraper. <laughs> a big ginger skull. You're getting aroused. Yeah, totally. <laughs> Testicles, all about it. So I have a friend going to see him tomorrow, and I was like, just tickle his testicles for me. I hit send and I was like, oh, because she's quite conservative. But anyway, um, so it would be great if I could be Prime Minister uh, tomorrow, and I would like to do all sorts of things. 
Um, but the first? The first thing I would do, I would make it, well, an absolute guarantee there would never be a lockdown in this country, not ever again. And no one would ever be obligated to have any kind of medical procedure for as long as they lived or died. I would make it such that uh, people who wanted to make Britain great, and that can be anyone from any background, culture, country, religion, whatever, anyone who's working to make Britain great, somehow, I don't know what the pass is, but like a fast pass at Disney, they get that. They get help to do that, they get free parking, they get reduced taxes, they get whatever incentivizes the grafters, the workers, small businesses and wealthy individuals. And then after that, we'll sort out the rest of the shit. But we have to turn over this idea that more and more people are currently thinking, and Martin Lewis, the money expert, is telling people, if you're under this much money a year, 40 grand, try for universal credit. And people are saying, what is the point of even trying? My life's so much easier if I give up. Hand it to the state. And I think that's exactly what the state wants. So we need to make the state as tiny as it can be and make people as big as they can be. Yeah. Um, the state wants everything, wants all of you. Mm, well, it's got two thirds of us in terms of money. Yeah. Like people do not understand how much they're taxed. And if they did, they'd be fucking angry. They do not understand. No. Nope. I sell a product, 20% VAT, 25% corporation tax, 45% income tax, national insurance, which is fucking nearly double digits now. Um, oh. You're forced to pay pension contributions to a state pension that's probably gonna get fucking spent. It's, it's gone. Uh, and, and business rates, yada, 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 all the stealth taxes. And then when I buy something, some, yes. like fuel is double and triple tax, sometimes there's double or triple dipping on things that you buy. And then there's inflation at 14.1%, which really means it's 20%. Yes. And then Everyone if needs you to die, wake the fuck up about it. Oh yeah, and then when, if you die, about 40% of that, what's fucking left is handed to the state. Or if you try and save. Yeah, well. You know, so anywhere else you put your money. Yeah. Dying, saving. Yeah. Well, this, like, Martin Lewis, you, meant, you mentioned his name. Yeah. People like him who are telling everyone to cut back costs, I'm sorry, they're putting the wrong message out in the world. Completely, no one is saying this, N or, or, or it's a voice I haven't heard. Yeah. So bloody amplify, totally agree with you. H how do you get out of a recession by receding? I so, and also- You can't. Also don't, it's sort of a, sorry, I just spat. That's all right, it didn't land on me. It, I definitely, I definitely saw it go. <laughs> you know when you see it go, and your only yeah. way is to confess, isn't yeah. it, really? Um, telling people to cut, it also has an inference of saying that what people should be doing in response to being brutalised is to bend mm. over, right? And, I, and that to me is the opposite. Emotionally, I want to go, no, fuck off. Yeah. But he's telling people, bend, you know, turn yeah. off your heating, turn off your lights, only use your washing machine at this time. Stop it. Yeah. I it's, mean, I get it, I get and, it. Hasn't he just been knighted? Has he just well, been knighted yeah, or something like that? Yeah, that was agreed like? away back. Oh, okay. Um, but, uh, yeah, so um, this is like something that fucks me off, what happened with Liz Truss. She made mistakes, we all make mistakes. Um, but actually, she's the only one of the three recent prime ministers in the last 12 yes. minutes that actually had a desire to grow totally. the economy. Like, we, we've got Rishi in, who's Mr. 100% tax, and we've got his, you know, henchman, who's Mr. 150% tax. Totally. And where are the growth plans? Where's the support for small businesses? Where's the incentives and the subsidies? They want to make a Silicon Valley in, um, in the UK. Well, then what you have to do is make it easy for them to start a business and reduce their risks for starting their business. You need to give them support, subsidies, grants. You need to reduce their taxes and increase their rewards. And it's the complete opposite. Totally. And I feel that. I feel that. I feel that sort of that feeling of being sort of crushed, it, it echoes outwards, right? So this repressiveness is surrounding people. So I'm gonna try and drive here. Oh, now I'm in an emission zone, so I have to pay 12.50. Oh, I'm gonna try and drop off at the airport. Oh, that's a fiver. Oh, I'm gonna try and drive, but suddenly 70 miles an hour is now 60 miles an hour because it's a controlled speed zone. And now I've got a fine and a ticket or two tickets. And that's how I feel. I feel like people's air is being sucked from them, so that life is a lot less about joy, right? So Americans kind of get or fundamentally understand 
um, that, that life is also about the pursuit of happiness. You know, so it's about liberty and it's about the pursuit of happiness and life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness. And, and where is the pursuit of happiness in the UK? Because it's ranking a way freaking way down the list mm. behind listening to Martin Lewis tell you how to save 5p by doing your laundry at 2am in the morning. Yeah. What has gone on? And I, and, I, and I don't know the answers to all of it, but I do know that getting... 3,000 people onto the end of Blackpool Pier and standing there for two hours and making them laugh and they leave feeling that people laugh and laugh and laugh and then at the end they cry and they cry and they cry because people offload these huge tanks of tears that everyone's carrying and it's, it's so emotional and that's how I feel people are walking around now and when you cuddle people up it's always tears that come mm. and um and that's been the joy of being able to speak here for the first time in five years, is that, is that being able to bring people and then be in a room together and look round and go, shit, we're not on our own then. And then everyone in that room be so brilliant to each other. Mm. Like if people lost something, someone would hand it in or someone fell over, someone would pick them up or a woman pissed herself and someone next to her pretended she dropped a drink. And it was funny. Mm. But that, that's my kind of people. Yeah. Like, that's how I feel we need to be now. Mm. I think lockdown and COVID mm. and the last while, and now particularly, it's like been a mass casualty event in this country. And people are fearful because things aren't, it's like a seismic shake went on and the ground isn't where it used to be and people aren't certain anymore of anything. Mm. And I think that's deliberate. And I think it's a real pity. Well, we'll come back to the deliberate part yeah. in a moment. Rem remind me about that, Harry, <laughs> about will. the deliberate. Um, we, we, Harry and I have decided to test out a brand new round on you. OK. So I uh, love Harry, so I'm going to love it. <laughs> I think I might have done Harry and I across our shows about 1,200 episodes. That's a lot. That is a lot. So many. And um, this is the first time we've ever done a round like this. OK, let's see how shit it is. Uh, all good. All brilliant. Yeah. Um, now, Harry and I um, have this little round to ourselves in the car all the you time. You two are so... <laughs> have you... Hold on. Idea. Have you uh, GoPro just... Or, or any other filming equipment, because you're the filming master, yourself in the car? When um, you two are real, real... When, you're, when he's real knocked off, he's had, a, he's had a glass of wine or two. Have you done any of that? that? No, because uh, I'd, I'd, get, I'd, I'd be more cancelled than Katie Hopkins if we did that. Wouldn't it be the cool... I bet you're... In fact, let's ask the listeners, because you'll edit this bit out. But if you would like to see Rob when he's kind of off duty in the vehicle, being driven by his mistress around the country, by mistress, I mean you, there isn't really a mistress, uh, then you should write in and let him know. And they can contact you at... katiehopkins at fuckoff.com. katiehopkins at fuckoff.com. <laughs> I'll find out the email address. No, all right. I'm, I'm, I'm going to so play the game. Cool. I'm going to play the game. OK, here we go. Support at robmore.com. Oh, no, you're being... So, I'm going to play the game. Sincere. I'm going to play the game. Support at robmore.com. Dot com. If yeah. you'd like to see Rob in his vehicle, probably in his boxes, are you by then? Do you no, I normally keep my clothes on in the car. Trousers undone, though. A little bit of trousers. I yeah, think. sometimes. A little bit of itching the old. If nappies. we've had too much burg <laughs> burger and lobster. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen it all. You've right. seen it all. So Harry and I play play the game. You, the, how Harry and you. How much would you have to be paid to? Mm. This is the round. This is right. a great game, and I always yeah. say, everyone has a price, and I yes. don't say that in the trite way. I say it in the number of things I've said. I will never do that. And then someone offers me a price. It goes up, and I go. <laughs> okay, so okay. you're up for, up for playing so this. Up for but this. what you cannot do is well, pass. You, no, you can, well, you can no, say you I can. wouldn't, but all right, I don't then. think you should allow oh, that. Okay, so no, you can't say I wouldn't. I, I think you should say you can't pass, you can't say I wouldn't. Right, good. How much would you have to be paid to vote Labour? Oh, well, it's piss all difference between them. Um, no political power makes any difference. So let's say two and a half K. Okay. How much would you have to be paid to publicly endorse Joe Biden? <laughs> oh, shit me. Yeah, that's off the charts, because I would probably be killed by my own side. Uh, a, a, a million quid. OK. How much would you have to be paid to work for The Guardian? <laughs> Actually, yeah, nothing. Uh, £2.50. But, but, uh, can I have a caveat? Look, do it. Yeah. 
two pound fifty just for the funsies because I could just. Uh, but I want I would want a wardrobe right of real 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 drippy like oh yeah 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 it's like basket waving this from like the nipples of otters but just pluck without killing the otter. That's the fucking I want the most expensive vegan recycled Stella McCartney vegan sawdust sausages in the pockets. I want the wardrobe because and the hair and I'm going to be a lesbian and I want nipple piercings. I want, I want the whole, I want the makeover and that'll work for them. And the reason I'd work for them is to find out their skullduggery and fuck them over, <laughs> obviously. <laughs> How much would you have to be paid to use woke gender pronouns? <laughs> <laughs> Most of these are Harry's, by the way. So if we get it's a little, little insight into his world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, well, let's you know, let's put a good figure on it. Two hundred grand. I definitely use some pronouns. Yeah. Give the cash to some straight male organisation. Oh, Canadian truckers. They get that cash. <laughs> How much would you have to be paid to marry Sadiq Khan? <laughs> oh my God! Nothing. I would do that for free. I would divorce lovely Mark. I would marry Sadiq Khan tomorrow. Because A, you know, killing off your husband. Never a bad thing. No, I would have power, right? I would literally have the dick of Sadiq Khan in my hand. <laughs> and it, well, I wouldn't need a whole hand, would I? I could just balance it on my little finger like that. Ooh, 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 and get what I want. I'd be like, come on now. Let's put some more white people back in zones one to five. Come on. Ooh, ooh, ooh. <laughs> Come on now, let's give some money to Christian organisations. Like that, it'd be perfect. But then it'd be short, I'd be married to someone short. I wouldn't, do I have to have sex with him? Yeah, of course. What? Of course. What? I barely feel it. He like, could, but, but he could look at deported while he's doggying you. Oh <laughs> I'd have to make a real effort. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I don't know why that appeal. This is why you get to spend so much time together because you find it funny. Yeah. But I feel like, so in my head, all I can think of is this little thing going into a big thing, but me not knowing. Because I don't think it would touch the, it would be like a cocktail, st like a coffee stirrer. <laughs> so I'd have to do, because like at my age, what we do, if you've had lots of children, is like, at a certain moment to try and be a good wife, we just basically squeeze. Did you, do you have children? Yes. How many? Two. Yeah, so your wife's already doing this. Is at a certain point we squeeze really hard, like a boa constrictor around a small hamster to make you feel bigger. So I'm not sure where we were going with that. But so if I was fucking, if Sadiq Khan was in any way banging me, I'd have to really squeeze so I could even feel it. Cause it'd be like a little tiny pencil. Okay, good. Carry on. <laughs> How much would you have to be paid to be a member of Black Lives Matter? <laughs> oh, that's going to take a price. Do I get outfits? You get, yeah, you can have They're the riders. Yeah. 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 Can I go with Stormzy? Yeah. That'd be hot. Yeah. Ten grand, I say. Ten grand. That's a fun day out. All right. How much would you have to be paid to be on I'm a Celebrity Get Me Out of Here? I've done that. Again. And the answer, so when I was paid first time, I was paid 35K. Oh, that's cheap. I'm so cheap, but... You top your prices. Well, no, this was back in the day day. Still cheap. Yeah, but I didn't know... Opportunity cost of time. Oh, come along, long, long. I just literally, I walked out of The Apprentice. I never yeah, they even saw knew, you coming. Uh, yes, I never even knew how the media worked. Yeah. I thought I was coming off The Apprentice looking like the fun, cool kid. Oh, you didn't know that? No. No, no I, thought, I thought everyone had spoken their mind yeah. and been a bit cutting. Mm. No, I just needed to run away and hide. Someone said 35K, it sounded like a lot and off I went. Yeah, it's not a lot. Oh mate. Especially after that. tax. But now we're doing yeah. the hindsight thing. Yeah. Imagine, naive. So Katie, how much this is now? a good idea. Oh now, I freaking hate not eating. Yeah, 400K, mm. bugger that. And definitely only if it's in Australia, mm. not Scotland or Wales, somewhere chilly. No. Mm. And just so people know an insight to that, when you're really starving, and you bloody are, they don't feed you, you can smell, because it's a set, obviously it's not the jungle, will that break people's hearts to know that? You can smell, so behind the mountain where they have the film kit, uh, you can smell their McDonald's. And it's the most painful thing, you could smell their burgers of the crew. You don't care? Mm. I cared. Carry on. No, no. That's another assumption you've made there, Miss. 
Mrs. It's because your eyes glazed over. <laughs> no. I just assumed you were bored fuckless. No. Well, How? Look at, well, you could try and look more interested and therefore, you, you know, own this. You know, don't make it about me. Feedback I've still notice. I've got slightly, uh, slightly feedback thinking noted. about your testicles. Do you know that? I literally just had that thought. I'm, think, I'm thinking about your cavernous vagina. <laughs> Because you like it's you big. were making out that he had a penis like yeah. that, but you did this with your yeah. vagina. It's big. <laughs> I'm just relieved. Like when I walked in, you two are so cute together. I'm telling you, this segment with you two. In fact, that's what we should do. We should have me with you in the car, and I get to run the friggin' thing because you two are really, really cute together. All right, we'll do. We'll but do that one But this is why I'm day. glad that there were these type of chairs because I honestly I cannot sit. See those bar stools? I can't sit on those. Yeah, you're quite fidgety, aren't you? Well, no, but it's literally my vagina. I, they go, I end up with five legs. So what, your vagina just hangs over the stool? <laughs> yeah, it's like, <laughs> like a lollipop in the face of a small child. It's, they, seriously, it's big. <laughs> I accidentally flashed my teenage daughter the other day and she literally nearly threw up. She's like, Mum, that isn't, that isn't right. <laughs> Just to mention that she was an 11 pound baby, so I kind of wanted to go, yeah, oversharing. You see, you do this, you go, I can't stop thinking about your thundering great vagina. Well, I didn't quite say it like that, but you, did he say cavernous, like that? I said. Thunderous great and did cavernous are cavernous? different. I said cavernous. Oh, does that make it better? <laughs> Just makes it different. Okay, so you say, I can't stop thinking about your cavernous vagina. Well. I just want to alert <laughs> And then, that's what we well, got going. But yeah, then you're, 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 that, like, you then you all go a bit you go a bit mousy shrewy as if you had nothing to do with it. Actually you did. You started it, you owned you're it. You're not very good at mind reading me. You think oh, you I, are. I don't, but, I don't think I'm trying to. Yeah. Well your face is deceptive then. Yeah, maybe I have a poker face. Alright, this one's a serious one. How much would you have to be paid to send your kids on reality TV? Oof. Yeah, no. Then no. Yeah, remember everyone's got a price. Everyone's got a price. How much? A billion quid. Yeah, no. I just, that's... Uh, you if think that fucks people, do you? Yeah, well, no. You know what? If they're... Well, one of them is 18. If they're... Whatever. But I can imagine my middle one might want to apply and then go for Brit. Like, if you want to do it, I'm not going to be the asshole that says no. Sorry for touching my mic. But I, I would prefer... I would be... I would be... What would I be? I would be anxious for the after thing of the void of what's left. I'd really, really like it if they, if they waited and were doing other things first. Because mm. I see the, see the kids and I just see the void of what, of the sort, of, sort of like walking on a trapdoor and waiting for the trapdoor to come away and you just <laughs> smash down and go, oh what, no one gives a shit then, that. Yeah, mm. I, would, I just would be wanting to kill everyone mm. in a motherly way. What do you think of Jordan Peterson? I think, it's really strange because like he's can be completely bonkers. I love that he's around. I love that he's back on Twitter. I find him utterly bonkers, but it's sort of great to have a, a massive mind speak the way he does. Same with Andrew Tate. I love him, but I love him because my son was listening to him and agrees with lots of what he says. I love that. So what's, the, what's bonkers about Jordan Peterson? Just some of the times there's this sort of overly teary weirdness. I just, I find, and I'm never one for burn your bra, right? Because I'm never, I've not been very female all along, as we can tell from my mannerisms and my vaginal issues. But I find that if a woman was to present in the way that he does, it, it would in no way be tolerated anywhere by anyone. She would never be taken seriously, but somehow, with Jordan, it's almost like, oh, who is this magnificent creature with the huge brain? But if a woman was to break down in tears and be a drug-addled mess for quite a lot of time, she'd just be disregarded from society. So maybe it's something about the redemption of the male that, that grates with me a little. And what is it you love about Andrew Tate? Oh, I love... It, go, it sort of chimes with the testicles of the Canadian truckers. Just, just masculinity, strength, power, and the fact that my 14-year-old kid loves a lot of what he says, loves a what, sort of sees that it causes problems and there's people who disagree with it, but so he's like balanced about it, but like loves that there's a guy being a guy. 
bloody brilliant. We need a lot more of that. I love it. I find masculinity so attractive. That's why you're safe. <laughs> no, but like... Uh, boom, boom, <laughs> ching. Yeah. yeah, that's why I just yeah. But like, I've been in rooms of men where there's just m mostly hair. Like in California, bearded men. Beards all the way down to San Diego. And that does it for you, Oh, it? God, deep voices. Yeah, just, mm. Mm. Testosterone, I think you can definitely, I think we swim in a current of our own making. You can definitely feel it. Mm. And do you think... Do you think I'm estrogen heavy? Do you feel it? Do you feel sort of waves of estrogen washing over you as I sit here? Yeah, I, th I, I feel a strong heterosexual energy. <laughs> Yeah, I do. <laughs> it scare you. <laughs> Carry it on. Are we no, there? no, it doesn't scare me. No. No. Um, do you think masculinity has been emasculated in society? I don't think it has been in the sense it's still there. And when you're amongst it, it's very exciting. I think the media are doing an excellent job and, and corporations, BBC, at trying to make it extinct trying to make it so, you know, so make it so you, you're trying to do a yawn then, you should just yawn. No. Do this. I wasn't trying mm. to do a yawn. You shouldn't, because when you stifle a yawn. Yeah, but I wasn't even wait. trying to hide one. Makes your face go weird. Um, but like, so they made it so, so people empowered by they, I mean, churches, governments, organisations, religious groups, make it so you don't belong, so you don't belong to your family anymore, because it's okay to have two mums or two dads or three mums or no, no one don't belong to your country anymore. You can't fly the St George's flag because it's a racist symbol. Make it so you don't belong to church anymore. Sell off the churches, don't belong to that. Make it so you don't belong to your gender anymore or your sexuality. Oh, you can be nothing, you can be something, you can be whatever you want to be tomorrow. You can say that you're a fucking slug. Um, but you know, just cut the legs off a cat doesn't make it a slug, does it? So, so everyone loses all belonging. And that's what big, strong men gave people was belonging. I belong to this man, I belong to this family, my children belong to this man. And you know what we're all looking for right now? is something to belong to. And people just have Strictly Come Dancing. It's so disappointing. What do you think of Russell Brand? I love him. And it, that's the 180. We're talking the same stuff, I guess. I mean, not the same, of course. But notionally, if we were to walk in a line, we're walking somewhere along on the same line together. And who'd have thought, what, five years ago, four years ago, Russell Brand was busting into my LBC studio, studio when I was live on air and calling me a, you know, rattlesnake-faced old cowbag who was inherently evil. And now we walk the same line. So that's been glorious. Have you ever talked to him since then? Oh, yeah. I, yeah. I bust into his studio after, <laughs> and, but I haven't seen him. I, I suspect that we'll find each other. I believe that stuff happens. Mm. So I, I adore what he's doing. I think it's brilliant and articulately brave. And I love that he comes from a side that wouldn't expect that to come from their own team. They'd expect it from me, my stuff. But the fact it comes from within is just the best. Mm. And if you could put it into a sentence, what do you love about Russell Brand? Apart from his testicles. Mm. Because he has a small penis. Does he? Yeah, he? yeah, but that's a whole other conversation. I love that Russell Brand... Is that small relative to other penises or your vagina? No, because that's always... You can't use that as the metric because mm. there's always going to be a flaw to that system, clearly. Mm. But small compared to other penises. Mm. The penises I have known... How do you know Russell lot. Brand's penis? We met. Yeah. Well... But you haven't seen my penis and we've met twice. <laughs> well, you're behind then, aren't you, son? <laughs> yeah. You need to be catching up. You well, need you, to book better rooms. You need to work on your estrogen, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> what I love about Russell Brand is he gives people hope. And he flies in the face of everything he's supposed to think coming from the side that he's supposed to be on, which was a contrivance anyway. Mm. What do you think of Piers Morgan? He's such a twat. 
He's the biggest twat and I've worked alongside him. I've spent time with him. I've had dinner with him. I've had offers from peers to do bad things. But he's such a twat because he just flows. And it's one of the things I, I cannot bear is people who flow, ebb and flow with the tide of what's popular and what isn't. So when lockdowns were in and he was all about it and everybody should be locked up and if you refuse the vaccine, you should never be allowed to go anywhere. Cut to yesterday, pictures of the Chinese protesting lockdown. Isn't this amazing? Everybody should stay indoors. Everyone should say, oh, here's my son with Black Lives Matter. What a, what a guy. Just that and the abusive use of people, thereby putting them on a trajectory to the rubbish dump. But as long as it gets him likes and clicks, he's all good. And Ronaldo is a case in point. You know, he, he, who did best out of the Ronaldo and Piers interview? Fucking Piers Morgan. And I just find something so snakily disingenuous. And every single time, like a turd in the Thames, he bobs to the surface. Doesn't matter if you put pictures, fraudulent pictures on the front of the mirror. Doesn't matter if, let's say, you bugged Millie Dowler's phone. It doesn't matter if you walked off your own show. You keep bobbing to the surface. That is not possible. So that what, is, how does he do yeah, that? Yeah, exactly. Then? The ultimate redemption of the male is Piers Morgan and his close networks with, I guess, Murdoch and Lord Rodney. So, yeah, there's the Sun and Daily Mail and Fox and... Yeah, mostly Murdoch. Mm. What do you think of Elon Musk? I just love him. I, I tried to marry him so often. Because he married his, I think, one of his wives twice. So he can change his mind. So my hope is that one day he'll think, oh, I'm done with hotties. What I need is some haggard old bag from the, from the UK with a massive vagina. <laughs> and maybe he'll, you know... Well, let's see if we can make it happen. Launch his own We're trying to get him on the show, so if we get him on the show, we'll can put you, in a good you, word. Can, well, or can I just be like, you know... Do you want to make a little plea? I, to Elon? Yeah. Elon, I'm offering you, I don't know, blowjobs for life. Most of your wives, I don't think they've been all that, and I'm definitely a contender. Also, I love that he called that the diver that rescued those kids in Thailand. He called the, the rescue team paedophiles, and he stood by it. Quite admire that. Also, I think he's quite good looking if you squint. <laughs> right. We have the world is fucked round. Oh. Are, you, are you ready for the world is fucked round? I'm so ready. Okay. How many genders are there? Two. And they are? Male, female. But what about someone's right to tell you what their gender is? No problem at all. So it's you, you're going to tell me what your gender is, but in the world is less fucked world, I don't have to believe it, but I'm thrilled for you. You're a lampshade. I'm so happy. Let me put a light bulb up your ass. Brilliant. Don't require me to think what you think. Okay. What do you think from work from home and four day work weeks? Fuck off. Turn up, work before your boss gets there, work till after your boss has gone, work harder than everyone else. If you don't like your work, find a different job. Can I just say that's what I love about Elon Musk? Because Oh yes, his Twitter thing. Work hard or fuck off. Yeah. Brilliant. Work really fucking hard or really fuck off. It wasn't just work hard or fuck off. No, it was it, like, yeah. you've got to go up to next level yeah. work. And, and the, but it's still, what was so magnificent. Anti-PR as well. There's so much PR from companies. Oh, come and work for us. We embrace all of this. It was so, so anti-PR. And the way it was also, like I would say to my children, do you want to brush your teeth or have a shower, right? And so you'll notice there, there's not really a choice, but I'm presenting a choice. And he did the same thing. Do you want to work hard as fuck or fuck off? But it's a choice. Mm. I love that. It's, the per it's exactly how you treat children. And that's what he did. It's just genius. Mm. What, what do you think of Harry and Meghan and the state of the royal family? So we've got one generation of royals left and then we're, it's over. And um, I think, it was a, a, you know, the world has a funny way of bringing broken people together. And that's, and the only problem with, I think, Harry and Meghan is that two broken people didn't make a whole. Yeah. Any other thoughts? Do you think that she's been divisive for the royal family? I mean, totally, but the royal family was over anyway. After the Queen, the royals were always over. Mm. And I just, the thing I miss, honestly, and what right have I to miss 
Uh, but I miss Prince Harry being fucking epic. I miss him in helicopters dressed in camouflage gear. I miss him with a bevy of blonde beauties balanced on his ball sack in Vegas dressed as a Nazi. I miss him being brilliantly fun and the Marines um, and military knowing that he was fighting their corner and being a laugh with it. I miss that. I wish, and I bet with all his heart, I bet he misses it too. So just emotionally, I miss Prince Harry being brilliant. Mm. And I, I blame that biatch for it. But that's, you know, either here or there. So you think in two generations, the royal family Done. is fucked? It's gone. It's already gone, really. It's an illusion of being there, which will be maintained by my parents and people like me who, who like tradition and know that people need something to belong to, but it's gone. Weirdly, that just really I made know. me feel empty. I know. Really weird. But that was the same when the Queen died, right? People found themselves to be more sad than they realised they'd be sad. I just think that woman, what an amazing woman. What a legend. What an amazing woman. And like, still, and still, she was like so ridiculous. That just before, and she literally had a clock to, to know when she was going, just before she popped off, she still thought, yeah, all right, then I'll say cheerio to Boris, right? Yeah. So there's literally a picture of her. So when the news came out, you know, she died, we were all like, no, she didn't. She just saw Liz Truss. Yeah. Like, would you do that on, the, on your last day on Earth? I I'd, I'd think the Queen's done so many things most human beings wouldn't do. Right? Yeah. What a dude. Like, yeah. I love the never complain, never explain. So it's good. so hard to never complain and so never explain, especially living in fucking Britain right now. <laughs> and did you, like when the whole scandal of the royal family 6.0 happened, Andrew, Diana, Harry, Meghan, she never lost any grace. Never. And imagine like your whole family just ruining she, your yeah. fucking legacy. So true. And yet she's there, bang. Uh, I think what a woman. So true. And that's yeah. why it was so, you know, so I was over in the States just as her funeral was happening and the massive, we would say queue, they would say line, was forming along the Thames. And to go and tell that in America was really emotional because American audiences were so moved by it as mm. well. And it was a very nice thing. So, yeah, yeah I miss the royal family, but I think it's gone. Mm. It's over. What do you think of plus size models on the front of <laughs> major magazines? Well, it's not even that. It's much worse than that now. You cannot, in America, go to a gym store, and by gym store I mean anywhere that sells sporting gear. The only model you'll see is one that is this big, because it's so, so right on to be more than obese. And it pisses me off, not because I don't support the fact that fat people should do some exercise, because 100% they should, but because I no longer know what it might look like on me. I have no idea. It's being modelled on what is effectively a, full, a small family-sized car. And I'm a bike in many senses. So it makes no sense anymore. And I honestly, I want to go in and say, do you have that on a small model? Because I have no idea. That was the point of models. It was to show you what it might look like on. So why are we just catering to chumba wumbas? I, I, do, I do break out into this sometimes at airports. Well, as in you'll just go and tell someone something? I'll just have a little, I have a, so, so I'm really good at like, to do, do, be positive, like it's all about keeping people going and this is the best time to be alive and boo, boo, boo. And then just, I just sometimes, when I need some food sometimes, like if I'm on a, what do they call those things that move? Travel later. Yeah. If I'm behind a chumba wumba and they're not moving, sometimes I go. Tell us what you say. Say, so you're not moving, on the travelator, is that a choice? Is that a decision? Is, do you think you'll still get there just by standing still? Could you get there faster if you walked? Do you think if you walked, it would be helpful? Do you think you would lose some weight if you did walk? Or could you get out of my fucking way so I can walk because I'm slim and you'll see how slim my ass is as I walk away? That sometimes happens. Fuck. Yeah, and then I have to walk faster because obviously they're not going to catch me because they're a fat fuck, right? But I just have to let it go sometimes. So do you do that because you think you're helping that person in the Casey no. Hopkins world, or do you just because you've lost your shit? Yeah, it's a bit of social anxiety about getting on planes because I have a fear of fat people on planes. What, and it what are you scared of? Them being near me. <laughs> or me sitting under. Then can I just say, that's Harry laughing, not me. <laughs> so that's your laugh. You were laughing. Why are you blaming Harry for your laughter? I'm not, That's I'm blaming so Harry for Harry's laughter. You say that, but your audience knows better. No, they don't. I, I don't want to wear fat people when I'm flying. That wasn't a choice. And then there's always this, 
arm and I've worn someone's lap before, like here, on my lap. And then fat people always sit like this, so you have to have their thigh on you. And when I see that, you know, you, you know, you're acting, you're doing the big naive, I'm Rob and I'm... You're so, trying to mind read me again, badly. I'm not, I'm telling people what you're like. No, you're, like, you're not. I'm the nice but guy. My, the, you are my guest. Okay. So your opinions are relevant here. So, but you so, travel in business, so you don't have to worry. But like, you if can, I'm you've in, got that choice. I do. Yeah. But if I'm in, let's just say I'm in premium economy. Don't be. Go work harder and get in, or charge more for, oh, I'm a celebrity, and then you can go in business. Totally. When I see the Chumba Wumba trying to squeeze down the aisle, and it's like, <laughs> and then they have to go sideways a bit, and then they have to lift the gunt over this chair to get in, and then they, and I see the seat beside me. You and just I said think, gunt. I can't believe you said that. Fuck, gunt. I know what it is. I just can't believe you said it. Why? I had one when I was a Chumba Wumba, because yeah. when I put on four stone. I thought it was all going to go on my tits, and I was like epically excited. I was like, boop, boop, and I was practicing how I would walk, and then it all went here in this massive gunt. Is the word gunt really funny to you? <laughs> I just haven't it's heard so it for so a long funny. time. You're so cute, you remind me of my son. Then. I'm quite childish, yeah. Yeah, yeah that yeah. reminded me of my child. Yeah. <laughs> um, wh what so about. So, my daughter, let's talk I what to about just tell you this thing. My daughter just got a new coat, right? But it's a shirt and it's also a jacket. But it's like a. She said to me, Mum, it's called a shacket. Right? And I said, Oh, what, like a gunt? And then I realised. She, she didn't know what one no. was. Yeah, no. thank God. Anyway, carry on. Is, is there an <laughs> argument that if you ha gave a more empowered, inspiring message about being overweight, you might be able to have more? impact oh. on overweight people. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm fucking nearly 50 years old, babe. Yeah, but you, 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 when, you did, you, when you did the get fat, get thin yeah. thing, well, how old were you? Not that long ago. I was like a full grown up. <laughs> I was like Yeah, 25. but what, in your 30s? Oh no, 42. Yeah, 42. All right, still quite young. Still not <laughs> even half your age. So <laughs> are you just saying you're too old now to give a fuck? No, <laughs> I'm just saying. Yes, and I do. Look, I do. I, I'm always out running and I'm always out saying to people, come on, even if you do five steps, you know, or I see people running. Like yesterday, there were two ladies running, mm. big ladies, and it was pissing down. They were running in a dirty lane, mud everywhere. They looked like shit. And I wound my window down and I went, yes! That, that is an empowering message. Mm. So don't mistake my true heart, but have I got time anymore to be like, so let's all be really good about going for a walk. No. Sometimes you've just got to tell it straight. And I'm done with being told I've got diabetes type 2. No, you haven't. You're a fat fucker. Get away from the fridge. That, there is room for that messaging too. Mm. Do you think some uh, people... You could take some of it. You've put on... How much have you put on since I saw you? Yeah, I wouldn't call myself a fat fucker. I'd probably look okay. better for it. But yeah, probably... Um, maybe... When I saw you, maybe seven kilos. So how much but I mean, I was lean pounds? then. I was only 76 kilos and I'm six foot three. And how much do you weigh now? Y yeah, probably seven to eight kilos more than that. What, what's the total that you weigh now? In the mid-80s. So it's quite generalised what you're answering. Is there not a specific number? No, because I haven't weighed. I didn't weigh myself um, 1.6 hours ago just to tell you the exact but this morning, weight. I didn't weigh myself this morning. Are you scared of the I scales? Haven't, I haven't weighed. My, you don't have to be scared of the scales not to weigh yourself. When did you weigh yourself day. last? Months ago. And what was the number? Mid 80s. Is that what it said? Mid 80s. Yeah. Well, when you looked down at the number, it said mid 80s. Did well, it, it might have said 86.3, or it might have said 84.7. I don't know, because it's got three digits with a point so you're after the second digit. Do you look in the mirror naked? Um, I, I, I like looking at my face and my dick, because I quite like them. But I don't, no, I, Do I don't really... Do you look at the bit in the middle? I don't really like the rest of my body, no. You I don't? used to I used to be really overweight when I was a kid. Oh, we've talked about this before. Yeah, we have. And are you frightened you're going back there? Yeah. Are you? Yeah, I've got a lot of food and, and body-related issues, yeah. But Even I'm... though I'm not fat, as you can see. Are you frightened you're going back there now? Yeah. I, I'm frightened every day I could go back there. Is that why you won't go on the scale? So I, get, I have extreme guilt every time I eat any food that's not really good for me. Any food at all? Any food. You never let yourself off duty? 
Oh, 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 I break, I break every day because I love really nice food. But it so makes have, you feel horrible. Yeah. I feel dirty and um, shameful if I, I like eating dessert. I remember this now. Yeah, I, I, I don't really like this about myself. Um, and, and by the way, listening to you talk about fat people certainly didn't trigger me, but it was just an interesting to raise that for me, were I to be overweight again like I was yeah, before, yeah, yeah, yeah. it's deep rooted. It's not just me being a lazy bastard. No. It's in, and, and getting to the root of the problem would actually help me lose the weight rather than taking my food away or, you know, shaming me on a travelator or whatever. So that's why I find this... <laughs> yeah, well, that's my but, own social but, anxiety. But but, 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 here's the interesting paradox. It was the shame of people calling me a fat cunt Oy. that ultimately, in the end, made me lose my weight. So I'm really grateful for the kids in three years above me who called me a fat cunt and threatened to beat me up because I was the fattest kid in my year. I'm actually really grateful for them. It's hard though, because as much as I can be like on a travel agent, if I hear you talk, and I can, you can see. Hear so yeah, I can see. There's some. You can hear that. Like, well, no, of course, there. of course. Yeah. As soon as you hear someone's sadness, you're like, oh god. But then it's hard for me to imagine you as a proper fat person because you're not. Yeah. So it's kind of hard to reconcile that. But what's also so weird is that someone so in control of so much, you run a massive business, you have your own enterprise, you have 110 people in your offices, you have this many I properties. I can tame the beast of Katie Hopkins. I think, I don't know, was I a beast ever? Yeah, I think so. Do you think? Yeah. Uh, do you think? Yeah. Quite like that. I think this content's really good. And I think a lot of people who wouldn't understand you will understand you more based on this kind of content, as but opposed not, to two, but, set, two sentences on Twitter, for example. Oh yeah, no, I'm not arguing that point mm. at all. I guess my thing is, uh, this is all I've ever been. There, was, there isn't a translation of me, this is me. No, but maybe there's this longer form content, which I really which like. Which podcast, you mean? Exactly, <laughs> podcasts. And you wanted to be reminded about disruptors as well in a minute. Yes. Um, but I feel that when, for someone so, in control in an entrepreneurial business space to then be so out of control emotionally around eating that's that's really that's like living that's living like a whole double stream life isn't yeah. it there's well, this guy and then there's this guy here who's like oh bollocks and that's really so you're carrying both of them but maybe we're all carrying this confident person and then this scared person and then this fucked person. Maybe we're all carrying all of those people and we just show a different one, you know? Yeah, I, I think we are. Um, Many people. Mm. I, I don't think that my greatest achievement is making hundreds of millions or writing 18 books or all that sort of stuff or owning hundreds of properties. I think my greatest achievement is not being fat because every day I have to face um, the I love sugar, I love food, um, and every day there's that addiction to it that's still there. Um, so it's probably a, the greatest achievement that I'm still only 80 odd kilos and not 120 kilos. That's much harder th for me than building businesses and making money, yeah. Isn't that wild? Yeah. Yeah. My wife still loves me though, so that's Well, good. you said you like your dick. Yeah. We can forgive a lot. Yeah. My husband still loved me despite my, what was it? Cavernous <laughs> vagina. That, that, that's your <laughs> So just so we have this clearly yeah. noted for future interviews, Rob Moore told me I had a cavernous vagina. You've, well, you've tweeted that. You've taken that so out of context. I just tweeted it in you my head. You did this yeah. and this. So you put Sadiq Khan's finger dick in a massive bowl of ramen and then I basically said, well, maybe it's not that Sadiq Khan's got a finger dick. You've got a cavernous vagina based on you visually analogizing it. When Elon puts my Twitter account back, you know, the first tweet I'm going to tweet, Rob Moore called my vagina cavernous. Well, make sure you tag me in. Oh, you, you know, do. I'm going to put a picture of you. I'm in. Looking slim. You're getting on back on Twitter. I know you are. Do you think? Yeah, I do. Elon Musk will bring you back. He's, he's, he's too pro free speech. Oh, I hope so. Yeah. I hope so, only for reach and share, you'll understand. Yeah. Not for some friggin' ego thing, just to be able to reach more. Yeah, yeah. Right. Disruption. Um, yes. So, Harry, what was it I asked you to? The deliberate bit. 
Yes, yes. That's right. So um, what so deliberately true. happened with lockdown and with our society? Should I go there? I should go there. Without prefacing. Because a preface really, I'm really pissed off with preface. I'm really, I'm yeah. actively trying not to preface things because it's weak. Just like I won't say at the start of this video, disclaimer, Katie, oh, yeah. Katie Hopkins' opinions are her own and not mine. Because oh, I, I, I think that is lame. That's that. I never do that. No, no but thank you yeah. for saying that also. Because when people do do that, I just want to go, well, well you fucking invited yeah. me, mate. And well, B, you exactly. want the click. Yeah. So fuck off yeah. twice. And also, if someone is not smart enough to work out that I have my opinions yes. and you have yours. They maybe shouldn't be watching at yes. all. You see, thank you. Can I, can I get you to, to, can I ring you to tell me that from time to time yes. when it really pisses me off? I believe lockdown was about testing control of populations. And I believe Wuhan or who, wherever COVID mm. was created in a lab, Wuhan was the perfect time and place with a meeting of people from all over the world to distribute the test and lockdown was a playbook response already disseminated to governments for how you would work with this pandemic or whatever you wanted to call it. And I believe lockdown was the test of different levers. So if I'm in the nudge unit that exists at number 10 and um, I'm from intelligence in the military or wherever, I've been given the different levers that I can try with my populations, because just as if I'm in advertising, I change my advertising up for the Spanish population. When I work with Diageo, we changed up for the Germans. So the different levers are gonna work differently on different cultural populations, and here they all are, and you're gonna try this toolkit. So the toolkit of control was implemented, it was tweaked for different lockdowns, and what was glorious if I'm part of the institute, the uh, World Economic Forum or anybody working for um, the new global order, whatever, is uh, we were able to pilot different levers and see some of them work so brilliantly we could roll them out in other countries, so we did. And if I was thinking of a specific example, uh, would be the way that if you take a problem into someone's own home and you change their behaviour in on their front doorstep or in their house, that's when you really win a population. So if you can start telling them how many people they're allowed inside your own home, you, you've really done something. You've taken a free people and told them how many people are allowed inside the house that they own. And one of the roots to that, and you saw if you were watching the evolution of this, one of the roots was to own the front doorstep. And the very, very genius thing about mobilising emotion of thanks and gratitude for life and that's where socialized healthcare comes in which is why biden wants it so desperately one of the strongest controls of a population is their health because everybody wants to live make it such that people at a specific time will stand on their doorsteps and clap at the sky to the false idol of socialized healthcare all at once and even better make it such that they then film it and upload it onto social media and it gets lots and lots of clicks and kudos. Make it such that people start dressing up and do full operatic performances. My neighbour had a fucking trombone. Make it such that when Harry at number 10 doesn't come out on his front doorstep, we're going to film his front doorstep because he wasn't there. And we're going to put on the local village chat that Harry at number 10 didn't come out. And I hope that when he gets sick, or his kids get sick, they don't get treatment. And it was, it's an amazing insight into humanity and its flaws, and an amazing, um, you know, if you could look at how you get quant and qual data very quickly from a population about how best to control them, it was, I think, nearly perfection. And that's what I believed happened. But to what end and what purpose and why? So that. When we move very rapidly, as we will, to a time where, let's take British people, we're no longer allowed to own our own vehicle. I say within five years, British people will no longer own their own beautiful cars, which might be sports and turbos. They won't have the right to do that. 
Uh, so you're wanting to know how best you can make that evolution. What levers of control can you do to enact that? Because that will be seen as an advancement that ordinary people can't drive and pollute. And so you migrate them onto a Tesla or electric vehicle and you make that great and you make them the good people. And then you take away roads while the lockdown's on and then you make cycle lanes and then you have places where you can no longer drive. And then you penalise drivers whenever they try and drive with fines. And then you make it so that all roads go down in Wales to 20 miles an hour. And then you create zones where people will no longer be able to drive between villages without getting a fine. And you see the evolution of where that's going. And then, of course, the same with money. Start training people to hand money back in. Start training them to swap around money. Start making them realise that currency won't be cash anymore. And to kids, it, my kids don't know what cash is. So that we have digital currency, which is a form of control. And then social credits. And in a way, that whole clapping at the sky thing was, was a form of social credit. Because you got the credit if you came out in full operatic performance, clapping at the sky and you lost social credit if you stayed indoors. So... And then, to what end and for what purpose? So that eventually, because we are actually uh, wasteful, humans are by nature becoming increasingly irrelevant, um, it, the grand plan would be, and what do I know, but um, is that people like me, ordinary people who are useless and users of energy, and uh, we're just consumers, wasteful consumers, we will live in um, mass accommodation blocks like the ones that were emptied out because the city of London doesn't exist anymore or if you go to Phoenix and look at what they're building or San Diego and look at what they're building over the public transport networks uh, once home ownership has been removed you'll all live in your government accommodation a social credit system will be in place a digital currency system where you'll own nothing and you'll only be able to move by public transport allocated to you on a social credit basis and thereby, at a top uh, level of government control, will be in place a global government, which we already see in the supranational organisations. It's all there already, uh, will be in charge, and everybody will just be a fluid mass of, of basically data banks with our data being harvested. And why does that benefit whoever controls the world? Because they have ultimate access to everything. They can, have, they can maintain the sustainability of the planet. They can do all the things they want to do, but I guess their, their ambition would be that that's long. That is the next evolution, right? The fourth industrial revolution, where we are transhuman, multi-planetary, and people like me are, are defunct. And what humans, names, organisations, do you think control the world? Well, everything you see or I see, maybe not you, maybe you, Everything you see is either Google or Apple online. They're two organisations that control all of online and they control everything that you see online. And so I would say those organisations control the world. And who controls them? I have no idea. Some sort of global forum, World Economic Forum, some small gathering of people who were offered the place at the table if they crashed their country. Because Boris Johnson, the only, only explanation for Boris Johnson is that, because he was, no, 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 we're not locking down, we're not doing masks, masks are useless. We're not locking down. March 2000, he got, was got at in some way. 2020, say, you mean? 2020, mm. pardon me. Mm. Mm. He was, people say, oh, it was because he was sick. No. He was got at with something, and it can't be bad stuff, because there's so much bad stuff about Boris and it bounces. Had to be offered something. I don't know what, but you know, you just see, because you see the world walk in lockstep, it's not possible for nations to operate so similarly without there being some kind of global coordination, in my opinion. And, and I absolutely respect anybody's right to call me a raving nutter for all of what I've just said. So, are you, therefore, net excited or net depressed for the future of humanity? A hundred percent excited. But I think that's partly because I, a hundred percent, I don't think I'm massively religious, but I a hundred percent believe in good and evil. I a hundred percent believe 
your path in life is set and the more free you make yourself like I am utterly free the more your path just it just rolls out in front of you and I 100% believe that um, that there's just there's so much I almost feel it sometimes or see it like there's so much energy on our side and by that side I mean the side that wants people to be all right and the power of that is so amazing and, and I found lockdown and COVID and all of that to be an amazing time because people that were on the side of, of good, which I think was against all the mandatory stuff, were just so splendid to each other and still are. And I, and I love that. And I, I feel so positive about it. And I see what the bad, I guess because I was always the monster and some people still think I am, we always need a bad guy. Maybe that's what the World Economic Forum is for me, it's the bad guy. But I don't believe, I certainly believe, um, it's why I spend so much time in America, they are our great hope because they have the one thing that we don't, which is they still have the right to bear arms. And you ain't going to get a bunch of Americans and tell them they're living in a sky rise anytime soon. So I think we will bend, but I think hope lives on, uh, way after my lifetime, which might be short. And that's fine by me and, and I feel like some of us, many of us, ran with the baton for a good long time, didn't let it go, took a beating ourselves, and, and then we'll smash it down into the hand of someone else. So yeah, I'm super positive. And final question. What does the word disruptive mean to you? This show is called Disruptors. Yes. What does that word mean to you, disruptive? Truly the brave, yeah. And every, every question, everything, you know? And it doesn't mean you have to think you can think I'm crazy and that's super fine, but question everything. You know, if I could, and I thought it walking here today, if I could just take the phones out of the hands of people, if I could put, have some big bag and as I walk down the pavement, just not to steal, but just to take the phones off people, I, that would be my whole heart. Because if two people, two companies, Google and Apple, really do control what we do, and then you ask people to look at how many hours have they spent online this week. So arguably four hours a day minimum, 28 hours a week. 28 hours a week of your life are governed by two companies. Terrifying. <laughs> yeah. Mm. So, but I'm, I'm endlessly po positive and optimistic about our chances. And what social media channels are you left on <laughs> that people can follow you on? <laughs> wow. Hopefully Elon, obviously is one of the Come on me. Elon, yeah. Um, then I'm on Instagram, underscore yeah. everything, underscore Katie, underscore Hopkins, underscore. And that's going great guns. Um, I'm on YouTube, Katie Hopkins Official. And I have a little site called Katie's Arms, which is like an online pub I ran during lockdown, as in arms. Yeah. And people can come on there and I do a live every Friday, which is not a podcast, but it is basically me with wine, taking the piss out of myself. So, and we talk about my vagina, so that's something you got some new material from this, People don't want to miss you? out on that no. after they. <laughs> so that's where people can find me, but um, mostly, you know what, I ask people to come find me on the road. Mm. Uh, and are you, are you going to be on the road in the I'm UK? I'm on tour in the UK. Ah. I can hardly breathe Tell it. us about the tour. In May. Yeah. Think of dodgy places. May 2023, yeah. Skegness. Yeah. Blackpool. Mm. Stamford. We lost a few venues. Stamford, Lincolnshire. Yeah. That's just up the road from us. Well, you know where you're going to be. Do we have an invite? Of course. Do we have a VIP you backstage have a invite? Room. You do. I'll All make right. sure your chair reclines next to his. All right. But you can face each other. We're so coming then. You can do it that way. Yeah. Yeah. So, I, I mean, I, I can hardly breathe that because the idea of it actually being allowed to happen is bigger than me. And, and it's just you. Me. One woman show. Yeah. Two hours of me and my vagina. Yeah. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> good, good timing there. <laughs> well, this is. He the, looked thrilled. I, I don't wonder if he might be our next guest. I actually. think he's going to log on to get no, tickets. No, that's not Dave, is it? D Dave? Yeah, we've got Banker Dave coming. Yeah, yes. Yeah. I'll just, I'll just smear myself across yeah. the glass <laughs> in a non-distracting way. Thank you for having me on yeah. Disruptors. Katie, thank you for being here again. I've had a lot of fun. I want to ask you something real quick. Um, who do you think we should have on the show? That, yeah, who do oh, you know or think? Man, yes. I'd love to watch that person. Yeah, anyone who's broken. I just think broken people are so brilliant. What was the lady who 
smoked so much or snorted so much. Daniela um, Westbrook? Yeah. yeah. Have you had her? No. Or Kerry Katona, she's brilliant. Do you know what? She was agreed to come on our show and my wife told me not to do it. Oh, no. I'm so respectful to your wife, but yeah. broken I think women, they are, they are the ones. Are they? Yeah. Yeah. That just not because I know you, you know, your audience is interested in finance and um, but, well, we have but, a good. I like variety of guests. Yes, I'm open to anything. But yeah. I think also these ladies have shown real endurance in different ways. Much of yeah. their problems have been brought on themselves, like me. Yeah. But there's an enduring charm to people who've been fundamentally broken. Right. Kerry Katona, you, you won't regret. No. Regret. Regret. <laughs> if I could speak, you won't regret. What do you think, Harry? All right then. Get on her OnlyFans. She's, she's got, got OnlyFans. Only Everyone's. Have you? Yeah, she's got OnlyFans, hasn't she? Don't, let's all act like we don't know. I, I think Kerry Katona has OnlyFans. Oh, right. As part of her way of enduring. What do you think about OnlyFans? That'd be great. Yeah? What, were they, what did the girls used to be called at Formula One? The... Cricket. Thank you. I, see? He's a researcher, isn't he? He's got it all. Yeah. Grid girls, yeah. I love. Whenever I'm in the States, I always go to Hooters. Love. Yes. I love. Shit that was me, Harry man. again. Yeah. But, you know, bloody use it. Yeah. How do you think I got, you know, my first job? How, do, how did I get some promotions I wanted back in the day? Jesus Christ. Use Great. what you've got. Yeah, yeah. It, OnlyFans is done with a woman's control. Prostitution. Fucking do it as long as you're safe and you're finally happy. Whatever makes you, whatever floats your boat. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Stop stopping women being whatever they want to be. Mm. You mean old bitches. Oh, you think it's mostly women that are stopping women, yes. not men? Yes. Mean ass bitches women who secrete lemon from their vaginas. <laughs> Those women don't want anyone else to have any fun. Right. They like haven't don't get much sex themselves, so they don't get it. Yeah. No one's making someone do OnlyFans as long as no one's making you do it. Perfect. Mm. Mm. What a perfect way to end. Boom. Thank you. Thank you very much. Pleasure. Well, I don't even know what to say. I'd like to hear what you say. What did you think about that insane conversation between myself and Katie Hopkins? Before you go, make sure you catch another Disruptors interview. You can watch it here. Before you get out of here, make sure you like this video, subscribe to the channel, and turn the notification bell on. And remember, if you don't risk anything, you risk everything.